Hello. I recently found out about a really interesting result that came from the Mars rover Perseverance. Uh, as described in a paper in Nature by Maurice et al., there are two speeds of sound on Mars. There's a speed for lower frequency waves and higher frequency waves. When I heard that, I really wanted to know why that happened. And so I looked at several popular videos and articles, and the things that I saw in them didn't make a lot of sense. And so I decided, hey, I've got a PhD in physics. I'll just go read the original paper. And what I found in the paper was very different from what most popular science sources were describing. So I just wanted to make a quick video to try and help non-scientists understand why there are two speeds of sound on Mars. To do that, we're going to have to learn a little bit about physics, and we're going to have to see an equation or two. But I'll walk you through it, so I think you should understand by the time we get to the end. I want to start off first by answering this question. Why is the speed of sound slower on Mars than on Earth? Most of these articles and videos that I saw started off by saying something like, you know, the speed of sound on Mars is slower because the pressure on Mars is lower. The pressure of the atmosphere is lower than it is on Earth. Well, it's not because the atmosphere on Mars is at a lower pressure. The reason the speed of sound is slower on Mars than on Earth is because the atmosphere on Mars is made up of a different mixture of gases and is at a different temperature. So, to understand that, let's think about what causes the speed of sound to be the speed of sound. Here's a little, I guess you'd call it a simulation I did of sound propagating through air. You can imagine these dots are like dust particles suspended in the air, moving back and forth with the air. And as these dust particles move back and forth, well, there are forces acting on them. When you speak or when a speaker moves, it pushes on the air. And imagine the, a speaker compresses the air. It increases the pressure of the air right in front of it. Well, that pressure being greater than the ambient air, it causes that little piece of air to push on the air next to it. And then that compresses that piece of air, causing its pressure to go up. And then it pushes on the piece next to it and so forth. Well, what determines how fast our molecules wiggle back and forth as the wave goes through? Well, Newton's second law says that force is equal to mass times acceleration. Or in other words, acceleration is force divided by math. Math, mass, by mass, force divided by mass. So what that means is that the how the molecules move depend on the forces on them because of the different pressures in the wave acting on them, but it also depends on the masses of the individual gas particles in the gas. So if you go through all of the physics and figure out you know, how these forces push on little bits of air, you come up with the canonical speed of sound found in most you know, uh, undergraduate physics textbooks. And that equation says that the speed of sound is equal to the square root of the bulk modulus of the air divided by the density of the air. Now, the density is just how much mass there is per unit volume, which depends on you know, how many air molecules there are per cubic centimeter and how much each air molecule weighs, what its mass is. The bulk modulus tells us how hard it is to squish the gas. If I push on the gas you know, so hard, how hard does it push back? Well, the speed of sound in air when you plug these values in turns out to be about 340 meters per second, depending on the temperature of the air. The speed of sound in water, well, water is a lot more dense than air. Water weighs more than air does, right? So you might think the speed of sound would be lower in water than air because the density is greater. It turns out the speed of sound in water is actually much higher than in air. That's because while the density of water is greater than air, the bulk modulus of water is much greater than the bulk modulus of air. When you try and squeeze water, it's really, really hard to squeeze water even a little bit compared to how hard it is to change the volume of air by squeezing on. 
All right, so even though the density of water is about 800 times the density of air, the bulk modulus is much, much higher, and we end up with a higher speed of water, of sound in water, than the speed of sound in air. Okay, now what is the bulk modulus of air? Well, it turns out the bulk modulus in a gas for typical sound waves is equal to gamma times atmospheric pressure. So gamma, this little parameter here, we call it the adiabatic index, and then we multiply that by the pressure of the atmosphere and we get the bulk modulus. And this kind of makes sense, right? If, if I have more pressure, it's harder to squeeze the air. As you pump up a bike tire, as the pressure increases, the tire gets stiffer. It's harder to squish it. So it makes sense that the bulk modulus ought to increase as the pressure increases. So the speed of sound then is just the square root of atmospheric pressure times the adiabatic index divided by the density of the atmosphere. Now the adiabatic index, it's a unitless parameter that depends on the gas and the conditions of the gas, but it's unitless and it has a value that never varies very far from one. So for now, we're going to ignore it. It'll turn out to be important later on though. Okay, so atmospheric pressure on Earth is really quite large compared to atmospheric pressure on Mars. In fact, the square root of the ratio of the two is one over 13. So if all that was going on was the pressure changing the speed of velocity of the speed of sound on Mars, you would expect the speed of sound on Mars to be six or 13 times lower than the speed of sound on Earth. It's not. It's just slightly lower than the speed of sound on Earth. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out that the bulk modulus scales with the pressure, but so does the density. As you increase the pressure in your bike tire, it increases because you're putting more air in there. To double the pressure, you have to put twice as much air in. So the density also scales with the pressure. And in fact, uh, you can show that the density of air is just the pressure of the air times the mass of a single molecule divided by a constant known as the Boltzmann constant uh, divided by the temperature of the air. So if I plug that in for the density in my equation, the pressure cancels out entirely, and I'm left with a more fundamental equation for the speed of sound in air. So there it is. The speed of sound in a more fundamental way can be written as the square root of the Boltzmann constant times the temperature divided by the mass of one molecule, uh, all times this adiabatic index we're going to get to. Now, sometimes I'll be teaching an experimental methods course, and students will decide that they want to do a project to measure the speed of sound in air in different systems using a vacuum system. And so they go and do it and inevitably they're disappointed because what they measure is that the speed of sound in air is the same as you change the pressures. So you pull a vacuum, you go down to low pressures, the speed of sound is exactly the same. So what does that mean? Well, the speed of sound on Mars is not that different from the speed of sound on Earth because it's independent of pressure. What does it depend on? It depends on the temperature and the mass of a molecule and this adiabatic index that we're going to come back to later. Well, the temperature on Earth, I mean, a typical temperature on a comfortable day is about 27 degrees C, let's say. Well, when we plug temperatures into physics equations, we usually have to plug them in in absolute temperature in Kelvin. 27 degrees C is about 300 Kelvin. Well, on Mars, a typical temperature is about, say, negative 33 degrees C, or 240 Kelvin. So the temperature on Mars is a little bit lower, which is going to result in a speed of sound, which is a little bit smaller. Also, the atmosphere on Earth is mainly made up of nitrogen molecules, whereas on Mars, the atmosphere is mainly made up of carbon dioxide. The mass of a carbon dioxide molecule is about 1.6 times greater than the mass of a nitrogen molecule. So on Mars, there's a lower temperature, higher molecular mass, and that results in a lower speed of sound. In fact, if we just consider the temperature and molecular mass alone, we would expect the speed of sound on Mars to be about 71% of the speed of sound on Earth, or about 243 meters per second. The data from Perseverance came up with a velocity of sound of about 250, pretty close to what we would expect. So what does this mean? The lower speed of sound on Mars is not due to the lower pressure, 
but mostly because of a lower temperature and heavier gas molecules. So if you are Elon Musk and you want to go to Mars to stage the next uh, Woodstock style concert, you don't have to worry about the, the speed of sound on Mars being so low that time delays will mess up the sound. However, there are three things that Elon does need to worry about. First of all, since the pressure on Mars is way lower than on Earth, there's fewer air molecules for your speakers to push around. So you're going to need some really big speakers to couple any significant amount of sound power into the atmosphere on Mars. Second of all, it turns out that sound dissipates a lot faster with distance on Mars than it does on Earth. So you're going to have to make really loud sounds at the front of the crowd in order for there to be appreciable sound at the back of the crowd. And then the third potential problem is this fact that there's two speeds of sound. The low frequencies are going to arrive at your audience later than the high frequencies. Is that going to mess up your sound? Is it going to make the concert sound weird? A lot of these articles I looked at said that, okay, well, really, you're going to have spacesuits on because you can't breathe on Mars and you're going to use communication devices and radios. But if you didn't, if you just tried to communicate with sound waves on Mars, it's going to be garbled by the fact that there's these two speeds of sound. Well, let's look into that. Why are there two speeds of sound on Mars? Well, to understand why there are two speeds of sound, well, we said the speed of sound is the square root of the bulk modulus over the density, and the bulk modulus of a gas for typical sound waves is the adiabatic index times the pressure. Well, what about this thing? What about the adiabatic index? The adiabatic index just basically tells us as I squeeze a gas, I go from a cold gas to a higher pressure, a higher temperature gas because I squeeze it. How much does the pressure change as I squeeze it? And it turns out as you squeeze some gas to higher pressure, you're doing work on the gas. You're putting energy into the gas. Where does that energy go? Well, some of the energy goes into the kinetic energy of the molecules. And molecules with higher kinetic energy bang into things harder and produce a higher pressure. All right, but not all of the energy goes into that pressure. There are other places that molecules can stash the energy. And so this adiabatic index, gamma, depends on the number of pockets in which a molecule can store energy. Now these pockets, these places where molecules can store energy, in physics parlance, we call them degrees of freedom. And it turns out that gamma is equal to the number of degrees of freedom plus two over the number of degrees of freedom. So as we get more degrees of freedom, gamma gets a little bit smaller, makes the gas a little bit more squishy, lowering the speed of sound. So let's imagine helium. Helium gas, it's a monatomic gas, meaning that the molecules are just single atoms. Helium atoms don't stick together. You just have a bunch of individual atoms flying around. So the only place that helium gas can store its energy is in kinetic energy. Well, there's three dimensions. So there's three dimensions of motion where helium can store its kinetic energy. So that means the number of degrees of freedom for a monatomic gas like helium is just three. And 3 plus 2 over 3 is 1.67. So the adiabatic index for helium is 1.67. So helium has a relatively high adiabatic index, which increases the speed of sound in helium. But that's less important than the fact that helium atoms have very low mass. So the main reason that helium, uh, the speed of sound in helium is much higher than in air is because helium atoms have a small mass compared to nitrogen molecules. But it's also helped by the fact that helium has a low number of degrees of freedom, therefore a high adiabatic index. And that's why when you breathe in a helium balloon and start talking, your voice is very high, because the speed of sound is very high in helium. Well, let's look at nitrogen now. So nitrogen is a diatomic molecule, meaning that nitrogen molecules are made up of two nitrogen atoms stuck together. And this gives the, and it breaks the symmetry of your molecule. Now it's not just a little dot, it's two little dots stuck together. So in addition to having your three translational degrees of freedom, 
Nitrogen also has two rotational degrees of freedom. It can store energy by rotating. So because nitrogen has more degrees of freedom, more pockets to store energy in, it's a little more squishy. Since there are three degrees of translation plus two degrees of rotational freedom, the total number of degrees of freedom for nitrogen is five, giving it an adiabatic index of 1.4, a little lower than it is for helium. Well, once you have you know, two molecules and you've broken the symmetry, you might imagine other ways you could store energy in your nitrogen molecules. So for example, you might imagine the molecules could vibrate. And that is a possibility. In fact, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can get degrees of freedom in nitrogen. But it turns out, quantum mechanics tells us that you can only activate those degrees of freedom if collisions between nitrogen molecules are energetic enough. And it turns out that at typical temperatures where we listen to sound waves on Earth, this, well, if we had this vibrational degree of freedom, we'd have an extra degree of freedom and we'd have a, lar a smaller adiabatic index. But it turns out that at typical temperatures on Earth, the collisions aren't energetic enough to turn on that degree of freedom or other potential degrees of freedom you could think of. So for nitrogen, we get five degrees of freedom and an adiabatic index of 1.4. Now, if you plot adiabatic index as a function of the number of degrees of freedom, it starts with a three degrees of freedom at a value of 1.67. And in the limit as the number of degrees of freedom gets bigger and bigger, this thing gets closer and closer to one. So the adiabatic index is always somewhere between 1.67 and one. It doesn't make a huge impact on the speed of sound. So we look at our speed of sound equation, the temperature and the mass of the molecules typically makes a bigger effect, but the adiabatic index does make some effect, okay? So let's consider carbon dioxide, the molecule that, uh, that dominates in the atmosphere on Mars. Well, carbon dioxide at the conditions on Mars for low frequency sounds, it has three translational degrees of freedom, two rotational, but then it has these two bendy vibrational degrees of freedom as well. So three uh, translational, two rotational, plus two vibrational, that's seven degrees of freedom, resulting in an adiabatic index of 1.29. However, it turns out this, these vibrational degrees of freedom, they damp out somewhat slowly. So for high frequency waves, the molecular collisions can't excite these vibrational uh, modes because they're already vibrating in a sense. And so effectively, those degrees of freedom are taken away for high frequency sounds. So for high frequency sounds, there's only five degrees of freedom. The gas is a little stiffer, harder to squish, and you have an adiabatic index of 1.4. So if we plug all the numbers in and use our theory, we find that for low frequency sounds, where we have seven degrees of freedom, we expect a speed of sound on Mars of about 241 meters per second. For high frequency sounds, where we effectively only have five degrees of freedom, we get a slightly higher speed of sound of 252 meters per second. If we compare that to what was actually measured by uh, the instruments on Perseverance, we get something that's pretty close. So there is a difference in the two speeds of about nine meters per second. So Conclusion number two is more degrees of freedom mean the gas is softer, resulting in a lower speed of sound. For CO2 at the typical temperatures and pressures on Mars, for low frequencies, we get three translational, two rotational, and two vibrational degrees of freedom. So seven degrees of freedom resulting in an adiabatic index of 1.29. But for higher frequency sound, the two vibrational degrees of freedom don't have time to damp out. So we effectively only have five degrees of freedom, for an adiabatic index of 1.4, resulting in a slightly higher speed of sound for higher frequencies. So what does this sound like? These different articles said this could muddle communications. So I'm, I wrote some software to simulate what happens when you have these two different speeds of sound. So here's a sample. Standing next to you and speaking to you, I would sound like this. This, this is what I would sound, sound like, like from a distance of six meters. meters. Well, I lied to you. That's not really what it would sound like. It turns out that for 
the small difference in speed of sound you get on Mars, it's really not a huge effect. So I had to exaggerate it so you could hear it. All right, so what I did is instead of having a speed of sound difference for low and high frequencies of about nine or 10 meters per second, I made it 100 meters per second. I made it 10 times bigger. Also, instead of standing next to you, I assumed that I was standing 100 meters away from you. Further away, if you stand further away, it makes a bigger difference in the time at which the high frequencies and low frequencies reach you. So to emphasize the effect again, I assumed we were really far apart. Furthermore, now the cutoff frequency for low frequency and high frequency sound velocities on Mars is about 240 hertz. And most of what we can hear is well above 240 hertz. So most of the sound you hear is above that. So mostly you just hear sound that's traveling at the speed of high frequency waves. So to make this a more dramatic presentation, I put the cutoff frequency at 1000 hertz instead of 240. Let's hear what it would really sound like if I used the correct parameters. So here's what it sounds like if I stand six meters away from you. This is what I would sound like from a distance of six meters. And then here's my simulation at a distance of 20 meters. This is what I would sound like from a distance of 20 meters. Okay, now let's go all the way out to 100 meters and listen. This is what I would sound like from a distance of 100 meters. So as you can hear with your own ears, it's really not that big of an effect. It's a really small difference. It's interesting, but it's not going to muddle communications. And in fact, it's not going to do much to affect our rock concert on Mars. So to end, I'm just going to play a little clip of music, which has been processed to sound like it would on Mars from the cheap seats in the back, assuming we could get enough sound actually to the back uh, for us to hear it. And as you can imagine, it sounds pretty much like sound on Earth. Thanks for listening.